now to hear the first episode of The Deerslayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Leather Stocking Tales, written by James Fenimore Cooper, bring to you faithfully and in detail that historic character, Natty Bumpo, variously called by his Indian friends, Deer Slayer, Hawkeye, and the Pathfinder. No more thrilling story of daring and human courage in the face of perilous border odds was ever penned, and you are invited to follow this story as it is presented to you over this station. The incidents of the tale occur between the years of 1740 and 1745, when the settled portions of the colony of New York were confined to a narrow section on each side of the Hudson. Broad belts of virgin wilderness, stretching away into New England, afforded forest covers to the noiseless moccasin of the native warrior as he trod the secret and bloody warpath. The leafy surface of the forest lies bathed in the brilliant light of a cloudless day in June and the trunks of the trees rise in cloudy grandeur. As our curtain rises, a man of gigantic mold breaks from the tangled undergrowth into a small clearing. He is accompanied by a slender woodsman and scout, the hero and central figure of this tale, the Deer Slayer. Hurrah, Deer Slayer. Here's daylight at last, and yonder is the lake. Do you know this spot, Harry? Or do you shout at sight of the sun? Both, lad, both. My name is not Hurry Harry, if this not be the spot where the land hunters camped last summer. Ah, but this stomach of mine pints at late afternoon. Open the wallet and let's wind up for another six hours run. We dare not risk a halt now with these lurking mingos likely to break out on us any minute. Ah, we haven't struck a trail for 24 hours, boy. Fall to and prove your manhood in this poor devil of a doe with your teeth, as you've already done with your rifle. There's little manhood in killing a doe. Though there might be some in bringing down a catamount. Then why have the Delawares named you Deerslayer? On account of a bold heart, as well as a quick eye and an active foot. Bah, the Delawares themselves are no heroes. Or they never would have allowed them loping vagabonds, the Mingos, to make them women. You don't understand the matter rightly. The Mingos filled the woods with lies and break their treaties. I have now lived ten years with the Delawares and know them to be as manful as any other nation when the proper time comes to stir. Okay, dear Slayer, we may as well open our minds. We haven't known each other very long. Did you ever hit anything human or intelligible? Did you ever pull a trigger on an enemy that was capable of pulling one on you? To own the truth, I never did. I hold it to be unlawful to take the life of a man except in open and generous warfare. The Delawares have been peaceful since my sojourn with them. What? Did you never find a fellow thieving among your traps and skins and do the law on him with your own hands? I'm no trapper, Harry. I live by the rifle. A weapon of which I will not turn my back on any man of my years. I never offered a skin that has not a hole in its head besides them which nature made to see with or to breathe through. Aye, aye, this is all very well in the animal way. Though it makes but a poor figure alongside our scalps and ambushes. Shooting an Indian from ambush has acted up to his own... Now that we have a war on our hands, the sooner you wipe that disgrace off your character, the better man you'll be. I shall not keep your company long, friend. Unless you look higher than four-footed beast to practice your rifle on. Our journey is nearly ended, Master March. And we can part tonight, if you see occasion. I have a friend waiting for me who will think it no disgrace to consort with a fellow creature that has never yet slain his kind. I wish I knew what has brought your skulking Delaware into this part of the country. Where did you say this young chief was to give you a meeting? At a small round rock near the foot of the lake where the tribes resort to make treaties and bury the hatchet. <laughs> Common territory. I'd like to know what Floating Tom Hunter would say to that. He claims the lake is his own property. And he'll not give it up to Mingo or Delaware without a battle for it. What will the colonies say to such a quarrel? Not a thing. Penn was never set to paper concerning hill or valley hereaway. What Tom claims, he'll likely maintain. By what I hear, Harry, this Floating Tom must be an uncommon mortal. Uh, what's the man's history in Nader? His Nader's more muskrats than human. Some think he was a flea liver on the salt water. 
a companion of a certain kid who was hanged for piracy. And he was wrong, Harry. A man can enjoy plunder peaceably nowhere. Some men have no peace if they don't find plunder, and some if they do. Oh, Tom seems to belong to Nather set, as he enjoys his, if plunder he really has, with his daughters, in a very quiet and comfortable way, and wishes for no more. Ah, he has daughters, too. Is there no mother, Harry? There was once, but she's been dead and sunk these two good years. Sunk? Well, I hope that's good English. The old fellow lowered his wife in the lake. He thought water washes away sin sooner than earth, I reckon. Was the poor woman uncommon wicked that her husband should take such pains with her body? Not unreasonable. She couldn't have been to have had such a daughter as Judith. Ah, I've heard the name of Judith from the Delawares, too. From their words, I do not think the girl would much please my fancy. Die fancy. What the devil have you to do with a fancy? And that, too, confounded one like Judith. You are but a boy, a sapling. Judith has had men for her suitors. She's not likely to cast a look upon a half-grown creature like you. It is June, and there's not a cloud between us and the sun. So all this heat is not wanted, Harry. Anyone may have a fancy, and a squirrel has a right to make up his mind touching a catamount. But it might not be wise to let the catamount know it. Ah, but you're young and thoughtless. I'll overlook your ignorance. Come, we'll not quarrel about a light-hearted, jilting jade just because she happens to be handsome. Judith is only for a man whose teeth show the full marks. And it's foolish to be afraid of a boy. Yeah, but what did the Delawares say of the hussy? They said she was fair to look on, and pleasant of speech, uh, but overgiven to admirers and light minded The Delawares are devils incarnate. Now, that's Judith's character to a ribbon. It's all the truth, dear Slayer. I should have married the gal two years ago. It had not been for two particular things, one of which was this very light-mindedness. And what may have been the other? Uh, Tuller was an uncertainty about her having me. <laughs> yeah, she has feelings that I find hard to overlook. And sometimes I swear I'll never visit the lake again. Which is the reason you always come back. Nothing is ever made more sure by swearing about it. And if you knew all I know concerning Judith, you'd find a little justification for a cousin. You ought to see how she wears finery and the air she gives herself when the gallants come over from the forts on Lake Mohawk. That's unseemly in a poor man's daughter. The officers are all gentry and can look on Judith only with evil intention. I know. I wish to look upon her as modest and becoming. And yet the clouds that drive among these hills are not more uncertain. If I was you, I would think no more of such a woman but turn my mind to the forest. That'll not deceive you. And if you know Judith, you'd see how much easier it is to say this than it would be to do it. Could I bring my mind to be easy about the officers, I'd carry the girl off to the Mohawk by force and make her marry me, spider whiffling. And I'd leave old Tom to the care of Hetty, his other child. Who, if she be not as handsome or as quick-witted as her sister, is much the most dutiful. Is there another bird in the same nest? The Delaware spoke to me of only one. And that's natural enough when Judith Hutter and Hetty Hutter are in question. Hetty is only comely. While her sister, I tell thee, boy, is such another as is not to be found between this and the sea. More than this, Hetty, I would say, is on the verge of ignorance. Even the Mingos know she's not just right in her mind, and she passes among them without harm. I see. She belongs to them beings the Lord has in his special care. For he looks carefully to all who fall short a proper share of reason. The Redskins honor and respect them that are so gifted, knowing that the evil spirit delights more to dwell in an artful body than in one that has no cunning to work upon. Ah, but tell me, Hurry... Uh, what reason have you to believe this gal has waited for you in the six months you've last seen her? I haven't the gal's faith, I know. But if she's dared to marry in my absence, she'll be like to know the pleasure of widowhood before she's twenty. You would not harm the man she's chosen, Harry, simply because she found him more to her liking than yourself. Why not? If an enemy crosses my path, will I not beat him out of it? Look at me, six foot four. Am I a man to let any sneaking skin trader get the better of me in a manner that touches me as near as the kindness of Judith Hutter? Besides, when we live beyond the law, we must be our own judges and executioners. And if a man should be found dead in the woods, who is there to say who slew him? Even admitting the colony took the matter in hand and made a stir about it. If that man should be Judith Hutter's husband after what has passed, I might tell enough at least to put the colony on the trail. You, you half-grown venison hunting bantling! You dare to think of informing against Hurry Harry, in so much as a matter touching a mink or a woodchuck? I would dare to speak truth, Harry, concerning you or any man that ever lived. Why, you traitor, a sneaking reptile, I'll choke you to... You may shake, Harry, until you bring down the mountain. But nothing but truth will you shake from me. It's probable that Judith Hutter has no husband to slay, 
And you may never have the chance to waylay him. Else would I tell her of your threat in the first conversation I held with the gal. I thought we had been friends, dear Slayer. But you've got the last secret of mine that'll ever enter your ears. I want none of it to be like this. I know we live in the woods, Harry, and are thought to be beyond human laws. And perhaps we are so, in fact. But there is a law, and a lawmaker, that rules across the whole continent. He that flies in the face of either need not call me friend. Damn me, dear Slayer, if I don't believe you're at heart a Moravian, and no fair-minded, plain-dealing hunter as you pretended to be. Fair-minded or not, Harry, you'll find me as plain-dealing in deeds as I am in words. No, oh, but this giving away to sudden anger is foolish. Proves how little you've lived with the red man. Judith Hutter is no doubt still single. And we'll say and think more about it. I would have been foolish to have called about an idea. The sun is turning toward the afternoon sky. We'd better strike the trail again and make forward so we can get an opportunity of seeing these beautiful sisters. Hmm, that's odd. I haven't heard a loom this early in the woods before. Listen, Harry. You may be a good woodsman, but your ears deceive you this time. That's a poor imitation. That's no feathered bird. You mean a red man's signal or I'm a half-breed. The Hurons are all around us, man, and they know our location. Oh, we've tarried too long with our hot words. The lake is at hand, Deerslayer. If we can get off to old Tom's castle, we're safe. Our present duty is to find your hidden canoe. Are you sure you can recognize the spot? Yes. It's in a hollow basswood. It ought not to be more than a hundred yards off. When did you get the word that the Mingos had taken to the warpath again? The news came to the fort two weeks ago. Any cause? Nothing but their natural cousinness. There's the sign of the varmints again, if you'll be right. And our scalps grow more precious every minute. Ah, but we'll circumvent them. See the crooked branches of that sapling hooked on the branches of the basswood? That's the spot. Are you certain? It's my mark. I did it last winter when the young thing was bent down with snow. I fixed it then as my landmark. And that must be your log a hundred feet ahead. Hey. Listen, that's them. Lend a hand, dear Slayer. It's the canoe, all right. As snug as if it had been left in an old woman's cupboard. Lend a hand and we may afloat in a minute. Let the varmints yell. They'll have to swim for us if they want our scalp. <laughs> 